the global education at the high school level worth it? Well, we're going to find out for sure with, with One World Now and Kristen Hayden and a very special guest. Hi, Kristen. Hi. Good to see you again. Our special guest, just for right now, go ahead and, and uh, tell us uh, who our special guest is. Philmon Hiley, who is a One World Now graduate and alumni who's currently at the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. But I want to know about One World Now itself. Uh, you, you basically, you're, you're providing an education for high schoolers who want to learn more than just reading, writing, and arithmetic? Yes, One World Now is a global leadership program and our focus is on developing the next generation of global leaders like Philmon. And we do this through a really innovative program model of language, leadership, and study abroad. Um, it sounds really simple, but nobody else is actually doing that comprehensive um, model together. The languages that we have chosen to focus on are Arabic and Chinese, two strategically important languages that are not typically offered in the public schools. And the leadership uh, work that we do is really the secret sauce of One World Now because that is what inspires the youth to actually um, take their visions and put them into action in the world. And then we send students abroad on scholarship to the Middle East and China typically during the summertime. And the other thing that makes our program uh, unique is that we actually are focused on underserved high school students. So the majority of our students are um, low income and students of color. And we work in um, Seattle public schools and also in an underserved um, community and school in Oahu, Hawaii. Language, leadership, and study abroad. Um, I'm curious, why Arabic, why Chinese language? Yeah, well, um, First, it's important to remember the context when One World Now started in 2002. It was just after the tragic events of 9-11. And um, I personally had uh, been living abroad for many years before that time. And I came to the US and I saw how uh, Americans were reacting to that and that there was a lot of fear towards um, the Muslim world and um, um, the Arab world uh, particularly. And so part of why we chose Arabic was just that it, this was a, a really important um, language and culture that I thought that Americans need to have greater understanding um, towards. And Chinese, uh, obviously, as a rising superpower that, again, Americans didn't have a lot of um, experience with, and particularly in our, in our public schools. So then let's get into the leadership aspect of it. When you're, you're talking about leadership, uh, uh, I mean, is there leadership that they learn here and then export that to the country where they go? Yeah, so well, the leadership are skills for life that support them throughout their lives that of course we want them and um, hope that they will use when they're in other countries but also throughout their lives. And again, the leadership is really the kind of the secret sauce of One World Now. People um, know us more from the languages that we teach because it's so unique. We're one of the only programs in the country teaching Arabic to public high school kids mm -hmm. in particular and the study abroad, the fact that we're sending underserved youth abroad. Those are the kind of the headline catchers that people know us for but in fact and I think again Philmon um, can testify to this is that the leadership is actually again the piece that empowers the young people to take action in the world and in their communities and particularly working with the youth that that we work with um, who many many of whom have uh, a lot of struggles and challenges to just get to where they are at that time and have been marginalized for much of their lives and told that they couldn't do a lot of things. Um, the essence of our leadership program is about expanding, expanding their sense of possibility to believe essentially that the world is their oyster and that things are available to them. And that's, that's the short version of what we do. Of course, Expanding your sense of possibility is great for adults and anybody, um, but particularly for these young people and for particularly for them to get this message at that early age um, is often becomes you know, the game changer for the rest of their lives. There's a lot more that we're going to uh, talk about with, with regard to One World Now, but, but as we get into study abroad and as we get into leadership and changes, this is a great time to bring Philmon in. Tell us about Philmon. Sure. Um, well, Philmon is uh, one of our alumni and one of my mentees. Uh, we have worked together for many, many years, and it's, um, it's a pleasure um, to be here with him, and I, I really appreciate that you invited Philmon to be on the show as well, because that's what One World Now is all about, is empowering um, young leaders to have voice and, and to tell their story themselves. So I just really appreciate that you have included 
included him in this um, interview. Uh, and we, we're going to talk directly to you, Phil Mon, I promise, yeah. but I, I have another <laughs> couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah. No. Why did Michelle Obama mention Phil Mon? Yeah, that's a big deal. That just happened this week. So uh, we were pretty honored that um, uh, Philmon was um, highlighted in Michelle Obama's speech this weekend uh, in Beijing. She is in the news a lot right now talking about how important study abroad is in particular, which is really uh, phenomenal. We're so happy that that message is, is getting out from our First Lady. And um, she, she quoted JFK talking about how we can learn uh, more from students than um, study abroad than than what they teach and then she quoted uh, Philmon and his quote about the uh, the importance and the power of citizen diplomacy so uh, and and uh, and again I'll let Philmon tell more of his own story but he's um, had quite a quite a trajectory um, which started in um, in high school with Chinese and what he's been able to do with his um, Chinese language studies and again Philmon's very humble so he won't probably tell this about uh, himself but I will tell you that um, Chinese teachers regularly, regularly pull me aside and say, Kristen, if I did not see his face, I would swear that he was a native speaker. Because especially in Chinese with the tones, which are so difficult, um, it's, they say it's just shocking that he is able to so well um, use them. And his, so his Mandarin skills are quite fluent and he's had uh, already in his, in his very young age, um, many, several years um, spent ab um, abroad in China. But again, I'll let him tell more of the story. All right, Philmon. Let's. Um, you're not from Seattle, are you? No, I'm not. No. Where, where are you from? I uh, was born in Sudan, in, er uh, in East, in in Africa, and my family. We were Eritrean refugees, and we were, I was born in a refugee camp in Sudan. How'd you get here? Um, we were one of the few families that were selected to come to the U.S. We applied uh, to come to the U.S. Uh, from Kesla, Sudan, and this, that's sort of the history after that. And yeah. so, you, so you made it here, and mm -hmm. you, but you, so you essentially grew up in Seattle. I grew up in Seattle, yeah. What made you want to get into the One World Now program in the beginning? Well, my older brother did the program first, and that's where I sort of got interested, uh, sort of in, stu in, in being One World Now. And after that, I mean, it was just sort of the possibility of learning languages and leadership skills. And um, that's what really excited me. I saw, actually, I saw a poster in, uh, at my high school. And that's when I just sort of contacted on World Now and wanted to really get involved. Yeah. Um. I mean, your parents were supportive of, of you learning Arabic or Chinese? I, I chose to study Chinese, and my parents actually were not very supportive in, <laughs> in the beginning. So they thought, they, it was, the funny thing was they thought that I was, like, you know, like, why are, you know, they're not, you're not Chinese, why are you learning Chinese, right? And I really had to enroll you're them in Chinese? the... You're not Chinese? Oh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> um, uh, so I really had to enroll them in the value of it. Um, it took years, actually. My father actually came around just recently and told me, that, oh, I'm really glad you learned Chinese. And I'm actually learning Arabic right now at the University of Washington. Also. Did your but father come around after the first lady acknowledged you? <laughs> no, no, before. <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, so they were not supportive in the beginning. So it was definitely. But One World Now actually did a lot to support me in that, actually. And their, their staff was actually sort of a second home for me. And they were sort of communicating, especially when I was studying abroad and really wanting to study abroad. My parents weren't necessarily supportive of that. My One World Now office was really supportive in communicating to my parents the value of studying abroad. And of course, I did my part in advocating for myself also. You know what, come on, and I'm, and I'm not going to try to embarrass you on this, but you know what, coming from Eritrea, Sudan, Eritrea, and then coming in a refugee program, he probably didn't come here with a whole lot of money. And his family probably didn't have a whole lot of money. But how did he get to spend all this time in China? I bankrolled him. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Actually, <clears throat> Philmont, again, has been really good about going after scholarship opportunities. This is actually a message that I want to pass on to all young people. There is a definitely kind of a stereotype that um, study abroad is a luxury and it's so expensive and it's not accessible. And it is true that um, we need greater investments in scholarships to study abroad but I always tell young people especially if you're young especially if you're if you are under 21 and you want to study abroad I guarantee there is funding out there um, some scholarships can't even some organizations say they can't even give them away that people aren't applying or they just assume they a lot of underserved youth in particular but uh, frankly, young people in particular, period, um, stop themselves for even before even applying, just assuming it's too expensive, assuming that they won't be selected, assuming that they won't, they are not able. So 
Philmon, um, no, he didn't come from a lot of um, money like a lot of our students, but um, he had you know, this strong desire um, to study Chinese and we actually, most of our students um, we send on a summer scholarship abroad, uh, Philmon, we actually ended up spending, uh, sending him for a year abroad through our partners at AFS um, to get a full, he had a full ride scholarship to spend his senior year of high school um, in, a, in a, well, you like to say it's not small for China. I mean, mm -hmm. it's huge from, on American yeah, standards, yeah, yeah. but it, kind of a small village for China, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, as, and probably you were the first um, African American that most of yeah. the Chinese in that um, town had ever seen. Yeah. And, um, um, but he was willing. He was willing to, to go for it, and we we were able to make it happen. I mean, basically, um, if there's w this is what we instill in our young people. If there's a will, there's a way. There are scholarship funds out there, and it's a balance of um, students like Philmon who actually. Um, have the intention and drive to go after these opportunities and um, we always say you know we will go to bat for you a hundred percent whatever you want to help accomplish we're we're on your side we're on your team and we'll help make this happen all right Philon, let's talk about china yeah uh when you got there what'd you think i mean it was pretty big shock at first i mean i had some of the language skills that one will know and the leadership skills i think came in most handy because i would actually spent a year in dc before i went to china so um, I, my language skills were a little bit rusty when I was in China, but the leadership skills were still very fresh. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that, that was very valuable. So it was sort of uh, a big shock, but I was really excited though. Um, about my, my, hope my, my school sort of, uh, sort of foreign liaison person came and greeted me. And um, I met him, I spoke to him in Chinese. It was really just experiencing the utility of it. I was like, wow, I can use it. <laughs> and then I met my host family and we all took this, we went a really long drive back home and I was sort of appreciating the countryside. And I mean, the first moments I think were really defining and I think were really exciting. And they actually, some, even at the time, they explained to me some of the things that you know, I could, could say and could not say and be careful about you know, getting involved in sort of things. And that kind of, they gave me sort of a rundown. Of, okay, you can't just yeah. run by that. You gotta tell us what it is. What was it? What are some of the things you couldn't say? Well, they told me to stay away from like, I mean, there's a similar rundown they gave to a lot of international students when they were in China. You know, stay away from political issues and that kind of stuff. And um, and sort of giving me sort of a cultural background and, you know, how, how to behave in school. Because, you know, school culture was different. I was going to school for almost 12 hours a day and I had to clean my own room. And, you know, it, it gave me a classroom. Oh, I had to clean my own you classroom. You had to clean your own room. Gosh, that's just a terrible thing. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, it was actually, it was actually very good. I actually chose to, they didn't actually force me to do it. I actually, was actually, when I was in school, and I think this was actually a product of my leadership training at One World Now, was I really pressured the school to treat me like I was a Chinese student. They really wanted to treat me like I was an international student and sort of transient. I was leaving in a year and I really tried to, I actually wrote a letter to the principal of my school to make sure that I could be in the Chinese classrooms, make sure they treated me like a Chinese student, you know, because, you know, the Chinese students are had to clean their own classrooms. I should have to clean my own classrooms. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be different from them. Uh, so I was very intentional about that. And I think that was part of my one now training is to that sort of immersion experience and I really wanted to have that when I was there. So what was a typical day for you mm -hmm. as, a, as a, an African American student in a Chinese school in China? Um, typical day for me was, well, in the beginning it was a little bit different than at the end, but a uh, typical day was I'd get up in the morning with my Chinese host brother. What time? Around, I, don't know, I guess around six or so. We'd get up around six. We'd have to be at school by seven, uh, or we'd have to stand outside the classroom as a punishment. Uh, <laughs> and then um, and then we would go to school. I'd talk to my classmates. And I could, at first, everyone was really excited to have me. Everyone was, was really fresh, and they're trying to partner me up with a girl in the classroom or something like that. And like, oh, yeah. and, and they tried to make all these jokes and everything like that. And uh, yeah, so, well, did it work? No. But and then we would go through our, our normal school day. And we'd have a big lunch time. Uh, something I thought was really, really funny was um, uh, that one of the students thought I was really good at basketball, and I tried to, because you know, like uh, they would, because uh, I'm an African American student, like, are you good at rapping? Are you good? Are you good can you play basketball? And they always try to play basketball with me, and I was always telling them that, like, I, I'm really bad at basketball. Like, no, 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 you're really, really, really good at basketball. I'm like, no, I'm not. And I, one day I played with them, and he was devastated. So that was lunchtime, uh, and then we would go to afternoon classes, and there would be an evening study course, because I wanted to experience the dorm life in China, even though I had a host family. I wanted. To 
again, sort of the product of my World Now training was to sort of immerse myself in the local culture and have, uh, you know, make local friends and everything like that. So I wanted to stay in the dorms with the Chinese students. So I, w I stayed there in the evenings and I, w I chose to study till 10.30 p.m. at night. And um, So that was your life? That was my life for the year, yeah. And we'd do that six days a week, except on Saturdays we'd have half days. Um, and oh. you know, so and again, it was just all part of the, so we'd get off at, we get out at 12 noon. And this is all part of my, at first they didn't want, the school wasn't forcing me to do all this. It was actually my choice to, and I requested they did this for me. Well, what were you, what classes were you taking? We had sort of the regular sort of curriculum. Um, we had math classes, we had uh, you know biology classes, we had Chinese literature courses, we had history courses. But and all, all in Chinese. Stuff. All in Chinese. These are all, all in Chinese with Chinese students. And it was interesting learning history from a different perspective. You know, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and those are sort of, so the normal sort of US courses, but in Chinese, and we had, Chinese, we, had, we had textbooks in Chinese, and I was expected to be able to read them and contribute and everything like that. You know, Kristen, one of the things I've noticed that you encourage your students to do is to write a blog mm -hmm. from wherever that they are. Mm -hmm. And what did you think when you saw on Philmon's blog that he was talking about how the students really, really liked his hair? Mm -hmm. Well, I think these are all part of the experiences going abroad. And our students are, um, I thought that was interesting earlier what you were saying about their stereotypes about an African American and you not fitting into that, which is exactly what One World Now is all about, is breaking stereotypes about what it means, not only in that example, but what it means to be American. When our youth go abroad, often we send youth in um, groups and um, there is an expectation, as we have experienced many times, that um, the group is going to look a certain way. I'll give you an example. We were in, we sent our um, young people to Morocco mm -hmm. and they were doing a um, community service project. They were painting walls outside of an orphanage and the local TV cameras came and they wanted to do a story on the Americans, you know, cleaning up this orphanage. And of this group of 10 One World Now students, there was um, uh, one Caucasian student and nine youth of color from various backgrounds and the television camera was like uh, where are the Americans we want to interview the Americans and we were like these are the Americans and they were like where 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 are the Americans we were like these are the Americans they just couldn't they kept repeating the question they couldn't understand and then they went uh, um, up to the white the one white student and um, had her represent and we actually had to have a a big um, conversation afterwards, which is typical of the, the types of conversations we have in our leadership workshops anyway, to you know move through that moment. Um, but I just think this, this is what we're doing, is that um, besides the fact that the study abroad is so transformational for our young people, it's, it's really the game changer in, in, in their lives. It was for me. I studied abroad when I was 15 in apartheid South Africa, um, and that experience changed my life, and it's the whole reason why I started One World Now many years later. Apartheid South Africa, your mom said it was okay to go? Yeah. It was, uh, it's funny did, did you should say that. Did she not like it very much? Uh, no, no, no. Actually, everybody was asking me, why, like, how are your parents letting you go? Because at the time, it was actually in a state of emergency. They were all over the news that it was in a state of emergency. And everybody was saying to my mom, how can you let her go? How can you let her go? And my mom had studied abroad herself. This is why her mentality was different. She had studied abroad in college. She was one of the first American um, exchange students to study abroad in Japan years ago. So she knew the power of study abroad and she thought this is an incredible opportunity for my daughter. And we grew up in Salem, Oregon and she used to say to people, Kristen could die crossing the street in Salem, Oregon, you know, or something could happen in South Africa. I mean, if they're going to have a program, she also knew that, I mean, Rotary, Rotary was sending me. Rotary is a very conservative organization. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not, if they were still having a program, they would cancel the program if they were worried about my safety. So I really appreciate that. And that's something that's really important, what you were asking Philmon earlier, is that um, I realized that I was completely privileged in, uh, you know, in many ways, but one of the ways was that my parents both absolutely supported me studying abroad when I was young. We do not get that with most of the youth that we work with. Their parents actually generally are not supportive, as um, Philmon said, not because they're trying to get in the way of opportunities, but for a whole host um, of, of, of reasons and um, so often it's even if we get the young people excited to be able to study abroad it's another effort to work with their families to get them to support um, this experience mm -hmm. but again it's completely worth it because I will fight tooth and nail to get any student abroad because I know as I said it will 
change the trajectory of their lives. Philmon is a great example. After those experiences that he had in high school, just opened up the whole you know world to, to him. He went to college at Swarthmore first, then transferred to the University of Washington. Got another full ride scholarship to study abroad for another year in China. Um, well, you know, well, let's go back to China though. You uh, you decided to take violin lessons. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was uh, again. I wanted to really experience. Okay, I, I knew it was a. I was again like for me growing up, um, coming. I didn't grow up with a lot, so I knew that the value of. I thought this was a once in a lifetime opportunity, so I really wanted to take advantage of all the opportunities that I had. So my teacher's wife was a violin teacher, and I wanted to learn violin. And so they, he had a violin there, and he said, "Do you want?" To, I asked his teacher, "Could you, would your wife teach me how to play the violin?" Because teacher was, and his wife was super excited about you know teaching a foreigner how to play the violin. And so I went to his house, you know, once or twice a week, and we would learn how to play the violin. But, but it was in a different way than what you thought. What was it? Was the Chinese way to teach someone how to play violin? What is that? I mean, I guess I mean the, the style of instruction I think was definitely different, and you know, the idea, the, there's a different numbering system. There's like a different number. There's like a numbering system that I wasn't used to before. And when you're playing music in uh, in China, there's sort of a different system that I had to get used to. But a lot of memorization. Um, and I mean, the teacher was very. I mean, she was a very good teacher, and I was I, and I was very willing to learn. So I didn't really feel too big of an adjustment when I was learning from her. But it was definitely. Interacting with my teachers in school and interaction with her was, I think, was a different relationship between the teacher and the student. How'd you deal with the food? It's a little different there, isn't it? Oh, I love the food. I'm a big eat. I'm a big food guy. He's very adventurous yeah, when it comes yeah. to eating. Yeah, so, yeah. so I'm, more I'm than a, most. Yeah, so I love the food. I was uh, eating everything I could actually. <laughs> Tell us some of the most more interesting things that you ate. One of the most interesting things that I ate. I mean, there are these things. I, I forgot. There are there these things with really awkward English translations. Like there was like 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 blood cake and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> it sounds like like yeah. really really weird. And my classmates were like, "Oh, are you willing to eat this?" And like, "Are you willing to eat this liver or that kind of stuff?" Like, of course, I'm going to eat it. You know, why not eat it? Right? I'm in China, right? So might as well eat, you know give it a shot, right? And it ended up actually being really 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 good, actually. And there are these things like you know, have you heard of stinky tofu before? Uh, no, I haven't. The, the one where you fry it and it smells terrible when you fry it, and then like it tastes really good when you eat it. I haven't experienced. Yeah, 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 well, the tofu is really offensive. The smell, and then when you actually eat it, and anything thing I like to eat, like a lot of street food and that kind of stuff, and and then also, and also like, if you eat some of the street food and you go into the back alleys and eat these sort of cheaper restaurants, one, you save money, and two, you meet a lot of really cool people, and that's what I really discovered. And that's the reason why I would go back there and eat a lot. I would meet fellow classmates, you know, because there were some foreigners who, you know, you know, for, for an American paying maybe twenty or maybe or fifteen or maybe or thirty or maybe for a meal, it's not a lot for an American person. You know, it's like a four dollar meal or a five dollar meal. It's actually really cheap for them. So they go to the fan to restaurants and they eat that kind of stuff and for me I was quite intentional about staying with my Chinese friends and uh, my Chinese friends obviously couldn't afford to eat at those restaurants all the time so I always went with my Chinese friends and I got to meet a lot of people there and so I was actually thinking part of going back to my one old now training is that was really sort of my intentional effort and in sort of being immersed in the local culture sort of there and I think part, it was part of that that really uh, meeting local people and getting a deep understanding of the culture really caused my transformation and really wanted to wanted to go back and learn more. Are you able to stay in touch with your friends from China? Of course, yeah. We talk all the time on QQ. There's a Chinese software. QQ. Uh, yeah, so we talk, we talk all the time. They're some of my closest friends. I mean, I, they're in high, my last year of high school, first, first year, uh, second year of college, and I go back and forth all the time. So, uh, and that's part of the, I mean, that's part of, I mean, something that's really powerful for me is something growing up, I never imagined that I could have friends like those, you know, friends across the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, and speaking to them in a foreign language. That you, you came up, you, you you were born in a place that is across the ocean. Well, yeah, I mean, I had family members in East Africa, my cousins and that kind of stuff, and they're, they're my family members. Most of, my, most of the people I knew across the ocean were family members. Mm -hmm. And um, and in speaking people in a foreign language, my, my dad always giggles when he hears me speaking Chinese, because QQ is also a voice software also, so you could talk. I mean, it's just really powerful for me, because you know, studying abroad really gave me an opportunity. What Kristen was talking about also earlier was realizing how I could be a contribution in the world, so, you know, really building uh, language skills, and then the, what really I was really empowered by the leadership courses to really figure out that I could use those language skills in the world to make a difference. Yeah. That's what was really exciting. Was there a, any time while you were in China where you felt uncomfortable? I mean, there was lots of times where you feel uncomfortable, right? But then like go. What? I mean, like you know, people touch your hair all the time. People taking pictures of you, and um, I mean, sometimes. I mean, for me, I'm pretty adventurous in my language. I always try to talk, so it doesn't really, you know. Um, this is saying in Chinese, your skin is really thick. I think we have that in English, right? I'm not sure, but anyways, thick skinned, thick -skinned yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't, I, I didn't grow up in a house that spoke English, so I'm not really aware of all of the idioms that we <laughs> have in English. Um, but okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, 
I mean, there were some times, like one time I think I was on a bus and uh, this guy behind me was feeling my hair without telling me. And uh, that made me a little bit uncomfortable. But I, went, I turned around and I talked to him and he, he's like, sort of did this, he like sort of looked away, or he was really embarrassed. And so there, there were times you definitely feel uncomfortable, but I think it's all going back to sort of understanding that you're there to, to learn, right? Yeah. And you have to be really willing to learn. So stepping into that com discomfort, I think is really important too. And that's definitely a message that we are constantly um, honing with our uh, young people is that to get out of your comfort zone. I mean, be study abroad I thought that was a great question when you said were you ever uncomfortable I was thinking darn right you're uncomfortable you're uncomfortable all the time and that's what we're trying to give them the skills to be actually comfortable being uncomfortable because study abroad, that's the whole point that's why most people don't do it is that you are literally ripped out of your comfort zone thrown into a different place suddenly you can't operate the way that is comfortable for you you're constantly challenged that's the whole nature of study abroad but the beauty of it and why it's such a transformational experience is that that experience is what uh, teaches empathy because suddenly you understand maybe for some people the first time in your life what it means to be other because when we're in our comfort zone and we're always acting the way that we're acting and saying the things that we're saying and believing the things that we believe those things aren't challenged mm -hmm. but when you're in a, an environment like that in a completely different culture and people are not reacting to you the same way and everything's different everything's different um, you suddenly are almost forced to experience again what it means to be other in a way that you might not have been empathetic before and I believe that's uh, you know empathy is is a great skill for 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 the planet right now and um, that's one of the best ways to learn it is by studying abroad one world now though is a high school program and we're sitting here with a with a college senior how does that work how have you stayed in touch I can touch on that actually please yeah I mean like because Kristen was talking about you know about all that, the empathy and everything like that I'm really glad that I had that experience at a young age you know you sort of really I'm a college student now, but I had that experience at a young age, and it really was a transformation for me. And you know, wanting to go to college and you know pursuing the things that I wanted to pursue in college is because I had that opportunity to experience that sort of empathy and learning more about the world and, and really getting me really excited about moving uh, forward. And I think that was uh, some of the connection. Now is I think I'm in college doing the things that I'm doing now because I had that experience at a young age uh, studying abroad. And I think that's why you know programs like One World Now who invest in youth right now, I think that's very valuable because, you know, you don't do these things automatically in college. You know, the mm -hmm. idea of studying abroad, going to a different country, doing mm -hmm. research abroad, I mean, these are things I didn't even know existed growing up, you know, and, you know, these things aren't automatic, right? I had that transformation in high school, and I think it would have been even more powerful if we had it at a younger age, but I'm really glad that we have programs like One World Now who are investing in you so that we can have these sorts of uh, uh, experiences when we're young, and then when we go into college, right, we're hitting the ground running, right? It's not the sort of awkward sort of, like, what do I want to study and everything like that. We have this sort of global perspective, this global worldview going into college. Well, what are you going to do with this? I mean, next for you? For me, uh, I actually got a, 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 uh, the Wrangell Fellowship, which is a State Department fellowship, and I um, will be joining uh, the Foreign Service in, in two years, so I'll be a diplomat. And that's what I'm really excited about, is having this new vision for the world and how states can cooperate together and how the U.S. can be that sort of, uh, sort of force in the world. And I think as a foreign service officer, I can take that vision and be of service to my country. View. And it's important yeah. to mention that, um, again, Philmon is a great example. Obviously, despite all odds, he had that experience at an early age and his whole life has changed. And to now, still being in college and being mentioned by the First Lady is incredible in his short lifetime already. Um, but the fact is, less than 1% of high school students in America study abroad. Less than 1%. And even a tiny fraction of that are underserved youth that are able to do that. So what we're talking about, this is incredible. I mean, Philmon's story is incredible, but it's just the reminder, back to Philmon's point, that it, this doesn't just happen in a vacuum. We have to invest in young people and give them these experiences at a young age. And this is still very, a uh, very, very small percentage of young people who are able to have that opportunity. And we'll let that be the last word. Be sure to go to the website up on the screen so that you can learn an awful lot more about One World Now. Take care. Rainmaker, believe. We can change